Hello, everybody. I'm Chris Wisnia, and I'm here with my best friend, John Morrow. Uh, thank you so much. Did I still say it wrong after I just asked? You said it, <laughs> you said it perfectly. Fred. Spot on. Oh, great job. Okay. Yes, John, it's so great to see you. Thank you so much for uh, meeting with me today. Uh, oh, glad to be here. This ought to be a lot of fun. Great, great. Uh, we go back a ways, and... Um, we were both at Comic-Con San Diego this year, and I, I, uh, I uh, kind of looking for your table, but some, somehow just kind of stumbled across and, and saw you in the corner of my eye. And I, I think you said it was, it was a similar thing. Isn't that Chris? Isn't that John? <laughs> and uh, so we, we got visiting and thought, oh, that would be fun to talk about Jack Kirby and talk about my comic, Doris Danger, that just came out uh, with Fanagraphics. Um, John, could you tell everybody about your uh, your publications? What sure. you do in um, comics, yeah. And it's funny you said that you, you had trouble stumbling across our table at Comic-Con this year. This was our, last summer was our first year back because since COVID. And uh, after a string of, uh, we've been every year since 1995, right after I started the Jack Kirby Collector magazine. So actually magazine is a misnomer the jet kirby collector uh hand hand xerox 16 page newsletter was uh, in 19, 1995 but um but you know it morphed as time went on um that was kind of that's how our whole business started um jack died in february of 94 and i'd been out of comics for a good while at that point and a friend of mine i didn't even know he died a friend of mine sent me the uh, obituary from usa today um, cause he knew I was always a big Kirby fan, but I'd been out of comics since probably the late eighties and, um, you know, said, Oh, wow. You know, I still, I kept a few of my Kirby comics over the years. I sold off most of my collection for, uh, to help with the down payment on our first house back in the late eighties. But I kept, you know, my favorite Kirby comics. I hadn't taken them out and looked at them in years. So uh, that whole spring I took the books out and looked at them. I'm like, wow, surely, surely Jack still has some fans out there. And, uh, just on a lark said, okay, I'll do a little newsletter for Jack Kirby. And, um, we were getting our graphic design business off the ground and had a little spare time. And so just kind of just for fun on a lark did it. And from there, boy, man, the Kirby fans came out of the woodwork. They supported it. They sent in uh, articles, lots of art from their collections, stuff that, you know, most people have never seen because Jack would have done it personally for him or, um, you know, uh, at a convention or commission pieces, things like that. And, or, you know, private pieces that he did for family members and friends and things like that. So, um, People sending that stuff in. Uh, uh, Roz Kirby hooked us up with, you know, Mark Evanier and Steve Sherman and uh, the different members of the family and stuff. So just kind of, you know, took off from there. And um, uh, we, after, let's see, after seven issues, we decided, well, let's see, we can actually sell this in comic book stores instead of just by mail. And um, yeah, Diamond, Diamond accepted it. And from there, it's just that, that did well. So then we started a magazine called Comic Book Artist with John B. Cook. Uh, that took off like crazy, won Eisner Awards. Um, from there, we started doing books. Um, and now, here we are. Gosh, so, oh, this is our 30th year, actually. We're this, um, 2024, 30th anniversary. So yeah. um, I'm actually about to start work on my 30th anniversary issue of the Jack Kirby Collector, which is number 91. So, uh, yeah, I know. It's a crazy, crazy long path. Um, my wife looks at me sometimes like, yeah, okay. This is, this is not what I had in mind 30 years ago, but all right. It worked out all right. That, that's you've been it. doing this. Oh, I'm sorry. You've been doing this how long now? I I published my first comic in uh, 2004, so I, I'm at my 20 year anniversary mm -hmm. with uh, yeah. Doris Danger. In, in yeah. Can you believe? You, you look back on 20 years and just like scratch your head, like, why am I still here doing this? It's. It you know it, it's funny you mentioned that. There's two aspects to that, and and the first aspect is wow, it, it's. It's been 20 years and this is all I've managed to produce in that time. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I turned 50 a couple of years ago and it, it was this shock of, wow, if, if it's taking me, you know, seven or 13 years to do each book and I'm doing the math, you know, of how many books I'd like to do and, and realizing I, I might have to start making some choices. <laughs> you know, yeah. Because there's only well, I just sent books. issue 90. Uh, to the printer this morning, as a matter of fact. Um, and uh, so 
90 issues in 30 years. That's what we're at about three years. That's pretty good. I not not to dog on my my good friends that produce um, Hogan's Alley magazine, but they literally ship their first issue the same month I ship my first issue. I think they're up to issue number 22 now or 23 in 30 years. So um, now, granted, theirs are a whole lot thicker and um, and they do a great, great job on it. So but I that's my benchmark. OK, as long as I can stay ahead of Hogan's Alley in the same amount of time, I'm doing OK. So. Yeah, being being that many issues, are is there a point where you think how much more Kirby work is there left uh, to share? How how much is there left to say about Kirby? Um, you know, I I as you can tell, you you've made your little cottage industry out of Kirby. There, um, the guy is just his career and his imagination was just so broad and all encompassing, and there's we're still finding stuff that we didn't know. Um, and still finding art that he did that we didn't know that he did, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. It's just amazing how prolific he was. So um, in the early days, I, I thought, yeah, you know, I'll get I'll get if I get five or six issues out of this. That'll be good. Nice tribute to Jack. And then it just kind of kept snowballing, and going and going. Um, I, I stopped wondering that years ago. Uh, because it would just seem like it would never end. But we still had people constantly like coming up to us at Comic Con and stuff. Yeah, how many more issues do you think you can do? They've stopped doing that now. I think I finally beat them to death with so many issues now. Um, you know, ninety issues. I think people are kind of like, okay, well, there's no end in sight. And um, yeah, I just turned sixty-one last month. So I, saw um, I think yeah. Oh, thanks, thanks. Yeah, I got a. I think I got another good twenty years at least in me doing this. <laughs> assuming people want to see it. I think there's probably another 20 years worth of stuff to cover on Jack as well. So there, there's um, so many aspects, right? There, there's there's his life, there's there's his art, there's there's all the different projects he did, there's his relationships, you know, the, the, uh, different different aspects of fandom. Uh, you know, I, I I can see how you know it, it really is so endless the the ways in to discuss. Well, we did uh, the, the issue I just sent to the printer. The theme is What If Kirby? And it's we've done little tidbits of that on previous issues where you run an occasional article that somebody says, oh, well, you know, if Jack, if the fourth world hadn't been canceled, what would the next two years have been like, right? And those are cute articles, and they're fun to read in, in limited quantities. But I think people think this issue is all just that, people's speculation like that. Um, it, it's This one's actually more fact-based. So uh, actually making logical assumptions and deductions based on what we do know of how things probably would have turned out, not just wouldn't have been neat if, uh, you know, Jack had whatever, dark side meat commandy or something like that. You know, um, uh, that said, uh, I do have my own little, um, for the first time, I'm doing my own little fan fiction in, in this is in, to replace my normal editorial. So people may, I, I kept it to a page so as to not to bore people too much, but I had fun with it. And um, I think people like that issue a lot. It's, but that's the whole thing. It's not just what he's done. It's what he would have done um, had he not, you know, been, you know, chopped off at the knees on, uh, on, on Spider-Man. This issue has a, a lengthy feature on what would happen if his, the version of Spider-Man that he introduced before Ditko took it over would have continued and also going into the history of why it didn't continue. So, um, yeah, I mean, you, there, there's just so many avenues. Um, I got an issue coming up. I'm calling it in the news. Uh, it actually deals with Jack's newspaper strip work largely as well as, you know, interviews he's done in different newspapers over the years and things like that. But, um, that's a whole realm few people know about. And Jack did a lot of work in newspapers, not just like the sky master strip from the sixties. Um, he did a lot of stuff in the fifties that people don't know about. He ghosted for Frank Giacoya on a, on a couple of strips and, and um, just, uh, you know, th cause that was the thing to do then, right? Comic books, that was your stepping stone to a real career, like Al Cap with little Abner, right? Or, or Ham Fisher with Joe Palooka. Those were the guys making the, the fame and the money in newspaper strips back then. So, um, you know, it kind of goes into Jack's various attempts to do that. So, it's you know, it's just fun to think this guy was so fascinating and so deep and had had so such a long career. I mean, he was literally working for 50 solid years in comics. So, um, yeah, we're not I, I'm not running out yet. So but I, I, I've got to mention the uh, Doris Danger stuff because I, I was so impressed that you managed to get Dick Ayers on board to do this stuff with you in the early days of it. Um, I thought that was brilliant. And I mean, I, I look at these things and I'm laughing my butt off uh, reading these. Uh, but at the same time, it's like, obviously, the love is there. You know, those were like the 
comic book equivalent of B monster movies that were that you're spoofing there, and uh, and you take it and just run with it, and it, it's I have a blast reading those things. Thank There's, you so much. Thank you so much. When I reread them, I find little tweaks or in jokes that oh I didn't catch that the first time. So I, I can tell you put a lot of effort and a lot of thought into how to make these things as entertaining as possible. So they're a lot of fun. I enjoy. Them. That that means a lot. Uh, coming from a, a, a Kirby scholar, scholar. and uh, I, I do pack a lot in. Uh, I, I, I enjoy for <laughs> myself things that, things that if you reread them, you, you still get enjoyment out of them. And, and so I'm always looking for ways to, to do that with, with my own work. And uh, that, that's nice to hear that, that it is noticed and appreciated. <laughs> Tell, tell me about the Fantagraphics book because I, I, you know, I try to as best I can keep up with the new stuff that's coming out. But usually I rely on other people to inform me because you know times yeah. that you, you know how it goes when you're producing stuff nonstop. Uh, I, I don't like get every issue of previews and pour over every single page that kind of thing. So wh when is the new book coming out? It it actually came out May. It, it's been out uh, half a year or whatever. Um, oh oh, I thought you were talking about another one coming out this year. No, no, no. Uh, oh, okay. But, so, uh, Dor Doris Danger, Giant Monsters, Giant Monsters. Amok. This, this is uh, the most recent book. And uh, yeah, Fanagraphics released it uh, just just last summer in, in time for Comic-Con when I saw it. Right, I remember seeing it there, and, yeah. Um, we, we haven't discussed uh, a, an, another Doris Danger book. I, I do have an, enough stories in here that, that I, I could put another book together. Um, we, we talked a little bit about how, you know, we, we, we've been in this for, for this long period of time. And um, I, I've been doing Doris Danger for 20 years and I, I self-published it for, I, I, as a, uh, a backup feature uh, in, in a, an anthology I did of, of tabloid type stories. And, and then um, everybody said, oh, we love those Doris Dangers. So I self-published uh, collections of them like this and um, and then SLG collected what I had self-published and and then I did a, another book with them <laughs> and then finally now I'm, I'm with uh, Fanagraphics and, and um, all these uh, paths I've taken like I, I went to SLG and I'd say here I want to pitch a project and, and they'd say that's not bad, but I really like those giant monsters. <laughs> so I'd go, okay, okay, I'll do giant monsters, and and then I, I uh, you know, I, I'd go bug Gary Groth at the Fanagraphics booth every year, and I, I'd show him projects, and he'd say, eh, eh, you know, year after year, and and then one year he said, oh, this is a good project. I think this is the one we're gonna do. But I do really like those giant monsters. <laughs> so we we just put out this uh, Doris Danger book, and. I have signed the contract for that other non Doris Danger giant monster book, and that that's going to be the next one. Um, but yeah, Doris Danger is is uh, that that nagging uh, you know giant creature behind me that I can't shake. <laughs> <laughs> what is that piece of art on the wall behind you? The framed comic page. I put that up what? special. Can you see what we've got? Her Hold on. Uh, let's see. This is kind of a a lesser. Is that, a, uh, is that from just just incorporated? It is. It's, oh, okay. All right. I was looking at that. That's, that's yeah. gotta be uh, around. Uh, I I don't remember when it was. Maybe uh, late '90s, early 2000s. The the Kirby Estate sold a bunch of art uh at at uh, a bunch of different cons and i i saw uh i i think i picked up four justice inc pages oh nice <laughs> and uh this this was before i was married uh you know when when uh before i had kids before i had a mortgage and uh and they were inexpensive and uh i i definitely couldn't afford them now <laughs> oh tell me about it i i look at the prices now and i'm just like mm, yeah that's that's a I'll, I'll have to content myself with you know seeing reproductions online and stuff like that so 
Yeah, the the Justice Inc. I I always really enjoyed, and I know it's licensed, and I I don't know that they've ever reprinted it. Um, but I I love yeah they the haven't old, the old pulp stuff. You know, I I love yeah. reading uh you know Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler and stuff. So so the fact that Kirby dipped his fingers in that pulp a little bit was just it it, it was yeah. it was lovely for for me and my tastes. So yeah. Yeah, that was a good little series. Uh, you know, I think that was a good choice to, I know, I think at that point, Jack was having to fill out a page quota uh, because they had canceled the fourth world stuff. And I mean, he could only produce so many commandy pages a month. Um, so uh, they had him doing a lot of different different things. That and the um, the loser stuff and our fighting forces, I thought both those were great choices for him. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously the time period of, of Justice Incorporated fit him perfectly. Um, yeah. We just did a... Um, in the in the new issue I just sent to press, we're reprinting an old Simon and Kirby uh, crime story from I think it's from Headline Comics that's never been reprinted before, and in it um, it takes place in the Lower East Side of New York, um, and also as the, the main protagonist is walking by, there's a sign that says Kurtz's Bar in the background, um, which I had never spotted this before. So obviously Jack's Jack's original name was Kurtzberg instead of Kirby before he changed his name. So I'm sure that was a little a little twist on that. And also that he said it where he grew up. It's set in 1932 in the Lower East Side, in which he was would have still been there then. So um, yeah, you know, just little little tidbits like that we can pick up and stuff. Uh, that that was, uh, those crime comics were great period pieces for him, so. Well, his his upbringing, you know, in the streets, I, I, I feel like when, when he gets the opportunity to draw these thugs, you know, and, and they're, <laughs> They're, they're crazy faces and hats and and the clothing and stuff it, it, it's just so full of personality i i always love it <laughs> yeah jack I, I i always wondered what it would look like if jack did um uh had gotten to draw dick tracy I've never seen jack draw dick tracy or the shadow there may be a drawing out there somewhere but with all the dick tracy villains and stuff i think he would have had a ball with that but i guess yeah. that just yeah. as corporate is as close as we get to that yeah. um for the for the uh new issue also since it's a what if issue, I decided to have some fun. And it's like the one company that Jack never worked for that I can think of was EC Comics. He never did a thing for EC. And I was like, what would a Jack Kirby EC Comics cover look like? So I mocked up two, actually. Um, let's see, we got one for Haunt of Fear and one for Weird Science. They're both in the issue. And I took two unpublished uh, Kirby covers from that era that he was using for like Black Magic or, or one of the mainline books, something like that. And uh, used them with the, you know, the weird science masthead and everything and, and um, had them colored and everything. They look really, really good. I think people are going to, they're going to look at that and go, yep, that fits. Now, I know Jack probably wouldn't have worked for EC because Bill Gaines wouldn't have cut him in on the action quite the way that he and Joe Simon had in their own company, I'm sure. But, um, you know, I, I think it's just kind of fun to see. And particularly that weird science stuff, it immediately makes me think, wow, if Jack was doing science fiction books for e EC, they unlike undoubtedly would have had Wally Wood ink him at some point. And that would have been the first, you know, Kirby Wood stuff, which would have been just gorgeous to see at that era. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. It, it, it's, uh, co comics are so different it, uh, in the mainstream. It's just superheroes. And, and for, you know, the, the later time of, of Jack's, uh, output, it, it was that, but he, he dabbled in, every genre and so like you say you know he did the science fiction he did the horror and uh so so that's that's an interesting what if to look at uh yeah well he did specifically he, at that era oh and he was doing this during those years <laughs> I, I i wouldn't be surprised i believe he probably made more money on the romance comics than on anything else he ever did in his career i would assume um you know, he was doing Westerns as well, because that with Gunsmoke and all in the 50s, that was very, very popular, even, even into the 60s. But um, but the romance stuff, I know those guys were just making a killing at that point for that that two or three years before everybody else was ripping them off and doing their own romance comics and stuff. So it, um, It's like the equivalent of image comics, huh? <laughs> I, I uh, Yes, I think for about three years there, uh, Simon and Kirby were both doing extremely well off their romance comics, so. Which is, you know, and then sad what, what Frederick Wortham comes along and the Senate subcommittee comes along and just kills comics right and left right after that. And it's, yeah, it's kind of sad. I mean, people have mentioned that even the romance comics were affected by that because before uh, the whole comics code came in, 
in the romance comics, the, the the females were not necessarily good girls, and they didn't always have to end up happily married at the end of the romance tale and stuff. You know, after the code came in, everything got watered down, even in the romance books. But that that brings me back to Doris Danger because I cannot think of a single uh, Kirby Atlas monster story where, and there may have been one. I'm not thinking of one where a female was the main protagonist who defeated the monster. But you've got Doris Danger um, arguably defeating these monsters, uh, if you would call it that, in these the way these stories end. Um, so why why did you pick a female to be the, the protagonist in these? Cause, which I think is fascinating. I think that has a cool twist on it. But Yeah. Um, the, so this this is how Doris Danger came about, is I, I had no thoughts about it at all. And I... I had uh, I, I went to college right during the image boom, and in college I didn't have money to really buy comics anyways, and so I kind of missed that whole image boom. And then when I graduated from college, it was the image bust where a, a lot of stores were going out of business. A lot of stores had quarter and fifty cent bins because they were just trying to survive, and um, so I that that's when I started kind of getting back into comics after college, after my, uh, art education. Uh, and I, I was picking up, uh, old horror and Western and war comics from the seventies, uh, old, uh, horror, uh, reprints of, of Kirby. I, I would find sometimes in, in these reprint bins. I thought these are really cool. And I, I, I saw, you know, on the inside cover, it would say originally presented in tales of suspense or whatever. That didn't mean right. too much to me, except that it's like, oh, this this is even older. You know, I, I was experiencing it in the 90s as a 20 year old comic that was reprinting an even older comic. And and so there's this sort of weird mystique to them. And, and you know, the, these Kirby monsters, they're, they're wonky and strange and they've got the underpants and the flat teeth, you know, and uh, they're, they're humanoid. And I, I just got such a kick out of them. And the, the title page was always signed Kirby and Ayers. So then I, I started drawing comics because I was getting into them again and I started going to conventions. And down at San Diego Comic Con, there was Dick Ayers. And uh, I knew he did Sergeant Fury, but I loved those giant monsters. And mm -hmm. so when, when I met him, I, I had approached him about, oh, maybe you could do a pinup of one of my characters or whatever. And he, he gave me his contact info. He was real sweet and real supportive. And uh, somewhere between the con and getting home, bing, wouldn't that be magical? to draw a giant monster story and see if Dick would ink it. And uh, I, I, I just became obsessed with, with this idea. I thought this, this is too crazy to even consider, but I, I went home and I wrote him this big long email. He said, yeah, that sounds fun. And uh, so, so then it was a matter of coming up with the story. So th this is a long answer to your question, but uh, I, I was thinking, okay, well, I, I've got to have giant monsters. And at the time, the X-Files were very popular. Um, All right. And at, and at the time, the comics I were doing were, were tabloid stories of, of private detectives, like we were talking about, pulp stories and uh, mad scientists and debunkers of the supernatural and things like that. And so I thought, okay, so I need some kind of character that fits into that sort of umbrella of, of this uh, tabloid nature. Uh, you know, National Enquirer, I, I was I was picturing like if, if the National Enquirer did comic books of their true stories, you know, in, mm -hmm. instead of newspaper articles. And so I thought, well, a, a newspaper journalist, it, it's it's a given. And uh, my, my earliest idea was for it to be a male character named Dirk Danger. And um, I, I was in the 90s starting to think about it inclusion, you know, I, I am a, a white privileged male that, that has tastes uh, that other white privileged males enjoy. And I thought, well, if, if I have a female character, uh, you know, then that 
that's uh, widening, you know, the scope a little. And uh, she, in, in the story, she's got an African-American boyfriend, right? And they're basically mm -hmm. the only two that aren't white American males in the story, except for, you know, your, your typical African tribesmen and your, your weird uh, French foreigner, you know, the, the stereotypes that, that you tended to see in comics. And uh, I, I look back at that now and think, yeah, I don't know that I would do this the same, uh, you know, 20 years later now as, as our culture is changing and stuff. But uh, that, that was really the idea. And, and my wife, who, who often just kind of pitches in a little this or that, she says, oh, you could name her Doris Danger. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and then it's like, yeah, I guess that's it then. Uh, See, we owe everything to our wives, right? They're, they're, they're the unsung heroes behind everything we do. They're, they're like, yeah, that's a different one. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I was thinking about your two morrows and I, I saw that you and your wife kind of started it together. And I wondered if, if that was the two of two morrows. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, we, and you said you, where, where did you go to college? Uh, what University Davis. I, I got a degree in studio art. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We, my, I went, met my wife, Pam, at Auburn University down in, down in Southern Alabama. I'm from Alabama originally, and uh, we were both in the art department there. So um, our first uh, collaboration was our wedding reputation, very unconventional, and um, had a lot of photos and stuff. And, and uh, we just made it a design project for ourselves, basically. And uh, you know, married right after we graduated, we moved to the uh, professional design on degrees in design out of Auburn. And um, we designed our wedding invitation. That was the first one. It was, uh, it was, it was um, the little credit on the back said designed by what was it? Tomorrow's graphics was what we put on there. We thought that was really clever. Yeah. For having any clue that we would ever do anything with it. And then in, uh, let's see, that was, we got married in 87. And 1991, we hung out our shingle as uh, Tomorrow's Advertising. And then in 94, we started Tomorrow's Publishing, which just with the Jack Kirby Collector. We didn't even call it Tomorrow's Publishing. then. if you look at the early Kirby Collectors, it's a product of Tomorrow's Advertising. Um, that was our graphic design and advertising firm. So. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, you know, right out, of, right out of art school, right. We learned, we learned, let's see, people, what year did you graduate? You were uh, already using computers, right? I, I graduated college 95. 95. Okay. All right. Yeah. We were, we graduated in 86 and the Macintosh computer had not yet invaded art departments around the, the, the college scheme around the world yet. So we had to learn the whole Macintosh computer thing, graphic design software all on our own. Um, and in fact, I think Auburn got their first Macs right after we graduated, that just as a lark thing. This, they didn't know if it was going to go anywhere. So um, thankfully it worked out for us. Yeah, yeah, we picked it up. I, I remember a, a friend of mine who gave me freelance design work. He, he called me over one day and he said, because he was an art director for an agency, he said, you got to see this thing. And he brought me over his little Mac SE. And um, or maybe it was the SE30, I think that's what it was called. But you know, the little all in one thing with the tiny little black and white eight inch screen. You got to see this. And he showed me, look what I can do with a logo here. And back then, you know, you, I don't know if you experienced this, but you had to do camera ready art for logos and you had to hand ink using French curves and, and circle templates and things like that. Any kind of graphic, right? To get these perfect clean shapes. And then you'd get your exacto knife and try and, you know, nick off any little mistakes you made and stuff inking it on vellum and uh then he'd be ready to shoot with a stat camera and he was showing me you got to see this look what i can do here and that was the very first i think that was adobe illustrator version one and look at look what you can do you can click these little things and make these perfect smooth curves and stuff like that and i was like i was like that's great rick but what do you do with it then how do you get it out of there you know, you do, you, you, how do you, how do you, and you know, laser printers were just coming on the, on the scene. Then they were what, 300 DPI. So it wasn't good enough for true camera ready art at that point. But, uh, but he was like, you gotta, you gotta get one of these. And sure, but two, three years later, we got one and it did kind of blow our minds. Yeah. But yeah. my wife still bemoans how terrible typography looks now compared to back in the old days when she used to literally, she worked for a big ad agency and they would literally hand kern the uh, the typeset galleries for the headlines cut apart every single letter and slide them with you know spray mount or, or glue or wax or whatever to to fix the spacing between the letters to make the headlines just look super exquisitely good. Wow. And uh, when we started on the computer, she's like, "This thing is going to ruin typography." I'm like, "Oh dear, no, it's not. It's not." And she's like, "Just wait." And <laughs> yeah, 
from from what we were taught, it's pretty much ruined it. But you know, now everybody can set a headline in three seconds. It's no big yeah, deal. But. Yeah. When you went into art school, what what did you envision for your life after? You know, as, as a career, what what did you see yourself doing? Honestly, I thought I was going to be an illustrator. Um, I did a lot of airbrush work back then, and that was my first work out of school. My wife was working for this big agency here in North Carolina, and I came up from Alabama uh, a quarter after she graduated before I did. And then I came up here. We got married. Um, she was working with the art director there and feeding me freelance uh, airbrush illustration jobs, which was really nice for big billboards and stuff. I still remember almost getting run over uh, off the side of the highway in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, as we're driving through, and our one of my very first jobs was a billboard for a now defunct airline called Piedmont Airlines, and it had this beautiful uh, airbrushed winter scarf running across it, all the way across it, and it, it said it had the word Piedmont on it. And that was an illustration I had to create for the billboard, and uh, so this is one of our first professional jobs. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's our billboard. We pull off to the side of the of I-85 there with cars whizzing by and stuff. And we're getting out, we're trying to take a picture. Thankfully, we had a camera then. Uh, we didn't have, you know, we didn't have cell phones then to take pictures with. But, um, uh, but that, that was the that was the thing. I'd be staying up all night doing airbrush work and you know pen and ink drawings, things like that. Um, thankfully, that didn't work out because I wasn't really that good at it. Um, I, I probably shouldn't have been working for that level of major ad agency at that point. Maybe I would have gotten better if I kept at it. But um, you know, eventually, she she went on to work for another agency. Um, I just started picking up freelance work around town, and uh, we eventually, she got to the point, I had enough freelance work that she could quit her job and work with me, and then that's kind of how we got started, so. Yeah. Um, but you're, are you, what, what's your day job? Are you still graphic design? I, I never did art as a day job. I am a uh, guitar instructor at the local music shop. Really? I, I do one-on-one -on -one guitar lessons, mostly with kids. Uh, kids are my bread and butter for sure. And um, yeah, people have said, well, wouldn't you rather just do some kind of comics, uh, even if it's not the comics you enjoy? And I, I think with my guitar, after a day working, the last thing I'm in the mood to do is practice my guitar, you know, after a day of working with the guitar. And uh, so it... It, it, you know, I, I might, I might argue differently <laughs> if, if I could make a living from my comics, but uh, this, this way I, I've got my job that I, I make decent money and then I can, I, I, I've managed to stay really excited ab about all my comics that I do, you know, for better, for worse, I've got less time to do them, but uh, the, the passion is strong. So. Wow, we have interestingly parallel paths. Um, I started, I was a music major for two years before I switched to art. Um, so, uh, and if, if you were like me, you're one of your parents, in my case, it was my dad, was just like, oh, good, you're going into an artistic uh, major in college. And then you switch to another artistic major in college. Just like, why can't you be an accountant or something like that, you know? Um all worked out. Sounds like it worked out for you, so that's good. But did did you have a parent that was kind of scratching their head, like, "Oh, brother, we're wasting our money here." You know, I I'm one of those rarities. My my parents were so supportive, and uh, what what was important to me, is, or what was important to them, was that I uh, just enjoy what I'm doing, and um, they they paid for my college for for you know studio art education. Yeah. And I, I actually asked my dad a few months ago, dad, what were you thinking? Said, you know, supporting this. And he said, you know, education is so valuable. And uh, he, he just wanted me to have that experience. And uh, I, I, I think they're, they're just glad I turned out okay. You know, I'm not a drug addict or, a, you know, <laughs> I'm not selling my body on the street, you know. Uh, it, it all works out and they, they're just glad I'm happy, you know, and they, they, they still buy all my comics and, you know, they're just totally supportive. So, yeah. 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 My mom was the one that was supportive of the art career. So um, she was 100 percent all the way. My dad was more like, OK, if this is really what you think you need to do. But um, but it was very satisfying when uh, my dad came up here. I forget how many years after we started the business, but he somehow thought, I found out, he thought all these years 
I was a t-shirt airbrush artist working at the mall. <laughs> I know that's crazy. While we're doing advertising, graphic design, and even early days of the publishing, that's he thought I, he thought I was doing t-shirts at the mall. Isn't I don't that, know where that got the definition of a graphic artist. The, well, the, I, I, guess that, I guess that's what he thought he, he spent all that money on college education for. So, but um, but he came up here and actually saw what we do, um, and it 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 was fascinating for him. He's like, wow, okay, so this is like legit. I, I think that was the first time I actually got a little respect from my dad in terms of my career at that point. So. Um, that that was that was a very satisfying experience, I must say. So yeah, for sure. uh, Kelly Jones, the the artist, you know, he does Batman and Dead Man and stuff. He said his kids thought he was just a stay at home dad all all their years growing up. <laughs> <laughs> John, I would, I, I would love to talk with you more. I, I'm on the cheap Zoom plan. So